Hallelujah. I woke up this morning with my mind on it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way, God. Hallelujah. God, we thank you, Father. Hallelujah. through like those songs are fast ones so so also give the song time to catch up <laughs> you, got, you got this don't be like me all right happy Ready? father's day dad Hi, Grandpa. happy father's day good morning church let's go ahead and stand and hallelujah. sing this morning happy father's day to all the fathers hallelujah Church on fire. The Holy Spirit is here and his power is real. Anything can happen and it probably will. Something very good, something good is going. There is a light that shines. There is a light that shines. Make the darkness appear. Power at work, but there's nothing to fear. Something very good, something good is going. This is a church on fire. This is a church on fire, this is a Holy Spirit place, we have a burning desire to lift up Jesus' name, let the fire burn in every heart, light the way, defeat the dark, let the flame of love burn higher, this is a church, this is a church on fire. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is here and His power is real. Anything can happen and it probably will. Something very good, something good is going on around. There is a light that shines. There is a light that shines. Make the darkness appear. Power at work, but there's nothing to fear. Something very good, something good is going on around. There is A church on fire. This is a church on fire. This is a Holy Spirit place. We have a burning desire to lift up Jesus' name. Let the fire burn in every heart. Light the way, defeat the dark. Let the flame of love burn higher. This is a church. This morning, this is a church on fire. Hallelujah. Woke up this morning. Woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind. Come on, church. Stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ain't no harm to keep my mind. Ain't no harm to keep my mind. Stay on Jesus. Ain't no harm to keep my mind. Stay on Jesus. Ain't no harm to keep my mind. Stay. Keep 
my mind Praying to keep my mind Stayed on Jesus Praying to keep my mind Stayed on Jesus Praying to keep my mind Stayed on Jesus Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Singing this song with my mind want to see Jesus lifted high. Let's go ahead and slow it down this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go ahead and start by singing Redeemed. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Through the blood of Jesus, I have been.
on church redeem 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 hallelujah I have been redeemed 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 through the blood of Jesus I've been redeemed 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 hallelujah church tell me you've been redeemed I have been redeemed redeemed come on Live. 
lips shall sing your praise. I lift my hands to you to bless your name. I surrender, make my life a sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Lord. Worship you, Lord. We exalt your name, O Lord, my God. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness, O Lord. He er le 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 me sirio no robo con na re le 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 be sandai. Father, we exalt your name in this place this morning, Lord. He er ne re le le be samanda ra la 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 mandai. Yes, my God, we thank you, Father. We worship you, God. We exalt your name. Oh, yes, Father. Amen. This morning, let's just come before God in prayer, church. Let's believe God for the many needs, the many hearts that need salvation, that need healing, that need a miracle in their lives. We want to continue to pray for Julie and Lynn. Continue to pray for Joseph and Darcy, for Cecilia and Dolores, for uh, Linda and her family, for Vandrick, Lauren, uh, Junior, Juliana. We also want to pray for... Uh, Lola Ferrer, that God would be able to just move upon their lives. Uh, uh, for Michael and Sally, uh, Claudia, uh, Joe and Liz. Uh, many, many people that need a touch of God, that need a miracle. Uh, pray for unsaved family members, unsaved friends. Pray for the backslider, that God would be able to grab hold of their hearts. Uh, let's pray that God would be able to establish his work and dominion. Uh, let's pray for the outreach this afternoon, and let's pray for the uh, upcoming revival with Pastor James uh, Wilkins from Fairfield, California. Let's pray that God would begin to stir hearts. Those that have received a flyer, let's pray that God would grab hold of their hearts and bring them to a place of salvation, bring them to a place of decision. And uh, let's pray that God would be able to help us this morning to have an open heart to what God wants to say. And so let's pray for these needs. Let's pray for those hearts. Uh, and uh, let's pray together, church. Father, we just thank you, my God, for this time that you have given us once again the opportunity to be able to stand in the midst of your presence, God, looking to you as the author and finisher of our faith. God, we pray that you are able to minister your word and minister your truth. God, we pray that you are able to uphold us, that you are able to keep us and sustain us. God, I pray that you continue to move upon each individual. God, those that need a supernatural work, those that need healing, those that need salvation. God, I pray that you are able to break chains and break strongholds. God, continue to help us to fix our eyes on you as we contend for the faith. My God, we ask your blessing even upon this service. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may take your seats this morning. <clears throat> I want to welcome each and every single one of you this morning to uh, the house of God, to the Door Church, and glad that you are here. Those of you joining us online as well, uh, glad that you have done so. You've connected with us, and we want to welcome you. Just a few announcements that I want to bring uh, to your attention, uh, this evening again, we are going to have another flyer pass out. We do have half of a box, a little bit more than half a box left of flyers. Uh, I want to say it's just a little over a thousand flyers left. And so if you are able to join us at four o'clock, uh, meet at Barnes & Noble. Uh, we're going to be meeting in the parking lot of Barnes & Noble closer to uh, the street, which I believe is Main Street. And so we're going to be meeting there. We're going to hit up that neighborhood in that area. And so, again, if you are able to help us, uh, bring your walking shoes, bring your hats, bring your water, uh, an umbrella to block out the shade, not the rain, uh, or block out the shade, block out the sun. You want the shade. And uh, so, again, if you are able to help, we ask that you come and join us at 4 o'clock at the Barnes & Nobles. If you have any questions, please let us know. And uh, 
we'll answer those questions. Our midweek service, 6 o'clock prayer, 7 o'clock, our evening service begins. And then the special announcement for this week, again, is going to be revival, revival, and revival. And so revival begins this Friday, again, with Pastor James Wilkins from Fairfield, California. That's going to start every night at 7 o'clock, Friday, Saturday, and then, of course, Sunday, we're going to have our regular Sunday morning service uh, with Pastor James Wilkins at 11, and then we are going to have the evening service at 7 o'clock to end that revival uh, with him. And so, again, if you are able to attend, I encourage you to be a part of that. We've been praying and believing God for revival, for we've been praying and believing God for a time of uh, to be able to have someone come and do a revival for us. It's very needed, desperately needed. And so you don't want to miss out. Come expecting God to do something in your life. Come expecting for God to speak to you. And uh, we do have a few extra calendars there on the back table that you can take if you want to be familiar with all that's happening for the rest of this month. And so uh, I believe that's all the announcements. One other announcement, actually, just again, want to. Wish every father a happy Father's Day. We do have uh, some small gifts. Um, if we can get Cody to get those passed out. So if you are a father, uh, if I can ask you to stand, uh, we want to give you a gift. Or if you don't want to stand, you can raise your hand and we'll give you a gift. So fathers, if you're here, raise your hand. It's a, it's a cruise to uh, the Bahamas. Uh, so you don't want to miss this gift. Lift up your hand. Want to show our appreciation. We want to we want to invest into some diabetes. Uh, we want to invest into some calories along the waistline. And so again, if we could give you a new car, uh, you deserve it. Um, but we don't have that kind of cash. So uh, oh, all right, thank you. Gonna bring me one. Thanks. But again, we do appreciate all you fathers. Uh, thank God for you. Thank God for godly men. I'll be ministering to you this morning in hopes to encourage you and helping you along the way. So uh, I don't have wrenches. I could bring you a used wrench or something. Maybe I'll bring you my broken weed, weed eater. Uh, anyways, thank God for you guys. Appreciate you all. Um, I believe that's all the announcements. For now, we're going to have a quick testimony from my wife on this Father's Day. And so she's going to come and share a special testimony this morning. Yes, it's special. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Um, so he asked me to testify. I kind of wanted my kids to share their testimony. I'm kind of like, oh, me sharing Father's Day. Um, okay, so Father's Day. For me, it's a little different. I know I'm going to get emotional. Um, my dad actually left my mom when I was about five years old. So in my testimony, my dad was obviously not a very good dad. He was very abusive, um, left my mom for a prostitute when I was five years old, left my mom with four kids. And then my stepdad stepped in, and um, he wasn't very good either. He wasn't a very good dad also. But he did take care of us. I mean, he inherited four kids, right? Like, he wasn't a godly man. So... When I gave my life to Jesus at 16 years old and I came into a church, I was just blown away by seeing families in the church. That for me was like the biggest change in my life that I was like, I want what I see in these families and these men and these women. So I want to thank my pastor, Pastor Warner. He is a spiritual father for me. Also, Tim Martin, he was my youth pastor, and him and his wife took in this wild teenager that was so lost and just loved me. And so there's men here in this place, Mr. Charles, who you can account as a spiritual father for kids. Like, I'm that kid. I'm that broken kid that will never be able to say happy Father's Day to their dad. And so this morning, I spent most of my morning texting men in my life who have been a blessing. I don't have a relationship with my dad. And even my, my father-in-law called him this morning, and 
I'm crying on the phone. He probably understood nothing I said. Just telling him, just thank you. I mean, he's not saved. He's not a godly man. But I'm very grateful for him just loving me, just, just loving me the way that I am. And so in my testimony, thank you for just being here. Thank you for just being a dad. Just you saying happy happy morning, good morning to your kids. Man, what a huge difference. Like I, I see my kids and I tell them, man, you are so blessed. My husband's not a perfect man, but you're a good dad. <laughs> you're a good dad. And thank you for just, for just loving my kids, for loving God. And because you love God, you're a good and wonderful husband and you're a good and wonderful dad. Thank you. Thank you for just being faithful. So thank you, all you dads who are here. Just thank you for just loving your kids. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you to Cody. How am I supposed to preach after that? I'm going to need all this song. <laughs> Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter uh, chapter 127. Powerful, powerful testimony. Let me get myself together here this morning. I wasn't expecting to cry, so here it is. Psalms 127. Oh, Lord Jesus. It is a special day. Father's Day is a special day. And, you know, just to be able to see uh, my wife's gratitude, even though she had two fathers bail out on her, she, she still has managed to be thankful. And she has still managed to uh, keep the faith. You know, she has still managed to remain steadfast. And uh, has learned to just grab hold of, of uh, men that have invested in her life. And so uh, I am truly appreciated for that testimony. I've been alive for 40 years. It's going to be 41 years in November. And I've been a father for half of my life. And I'll tell you what. I've seen a dramatic change in the way that fathers fill their role. And I've seen the gap between father and children uh, grow. I've seen the gap between father and their children expand, that there's a gap. There isn't much of an investment nowadays from uh, fathers into their family. But I believe that God is in the business of restoring that relationship of restoring that family of restoring a bond between a father and his children and it is meant for a father to be very much involved because fathers play an important role in family it was in 2008 senator barack obama this is when he was senator gave a father's uh, a Father's Day speech to a apostol to Apostolic Church of God in Chicago. And he said, children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime. Nine times more likely to drop out of schools and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Then there's an article that I read in WNG.org that was dated January 31st of 2020. And it caught my attention because it had the title, Dads Matter. And I don't know about you, but I agree with that statement. Dads matter. But it went on to say the subtitle stated, Kobe Bryant's death highlights the importance of fatherhood. The article stated the negative outcomes of fatherlessness far outweigh the educational, socioeconomic, and racial disadvantages. But uh, the way that the article ended paints the picture of what the heart of fatherhood is. The article ended with this. The article said, Duncan met Bryant 
two years ago at an event and talked with him about being the father of girls. Duncan says, when I reflect on this tragedy and that half an hour I spent with Kobe Bryant two years ago, I suppose that the only small comfort or the only small source of comfort for me is knowing that he died doing what he loved the most, being a dad. And here we can see Kobe Bryant was on his way to his daughter's basketball game. He was being a dad. He was being the supporter. He was uh, uh, supporting his daughter in the dreams that she had. And uh, he died doing what he loved doing most, and that was being a dad. If an article would be written about you at the end of your life, would it end saying the same thing? That you die doing what you love to do, and that is being a dad. I want to read Psalms 127, and I want to minister this morning a father's aim, because we as fathers have to have an aim, and it doesn't matter if you are a, a, a dad now, but maybe you're planning to be a dad, and maybe one day you're going to be a dad. But one way or another, hopefully this would be able to minister to your life. Psalms 127, the Bible says, beginning in verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. There has been an erosion of fatherhood over these 30 plus years of my life. From what I can remember at 10 years old, 9 years of age, and the 30 years after that, there has been a collapse, there has been an erosion, there has been a distraction or a destruction uh, uh, on the image of fatherhood. That fatherhood is no longer this, uh, this, uh, uh, this tough guy image anymore. That they've, uh, they've, they've lowered the standard and, and uh, they've, uh, uh, they've weakened it down. And so here we're able to stand and to say, you know what? God wants us to be fathers. God wants us to be leaders. God wants us to be supporters and providers. And uh, we have to be able to reclaim our role as fathers. I believe we're in a time as God-fearing fathers, that we need to father up and reclaim that role. As I mentioned to the guys yesterday during the men's discipleship class, it's, it's not easy being the man. It's, it's especially not easy being a godly man. It's one thing to be a man in this world, but it's another thing to be a godly man. To have conviction, to have a, a, a desire to live for God and to be able to, to stand and desire uh, uh, to do what God wants us to do. It's not that easy to do God's will. We can all come up with excuses of why we can't be that man. We, we can all come up with excuses of why we can't do this and we can't do that. But it's not easy being a godly man, a godly father. Even though I've read many studies showing that our children are influenced by media, right? They're, they go on their social media, it influences them, their friends influence them. Uh, there's all kinds of influences out there upon our kids. But I'm a firm believer that we as parents, especially as fathers, we still hold a bigger influential piece of that pie that we still play a big role in our children's lives. I want us to look at, first of all, the arrow and the archer. 
In our text, the word children, in its literal Hebrew translation, is the word son. And so the son is the builder of the family, of the family name, that it's the son who carries on that name and has more sons and carries the name down and his sons has more sons and his sons has more sons. And so it's the son that carries that heritage in its literal translation. And so the literal translation says that sons are a heritage from the Lord, meaning that the sons are given by the Lord, and the man who has a quiver full of them is happy. A man who has many sons is happy, is what this, this text is telling us. Now, does this mean that man, uh, uh, that a man with only daughters isn't happy? That's not what I'm saying this morning. I love my daughter. And uh, I actually wanted four daughters, and so I ended up getting the pair, in which I was good after they started growing and having their attitude. I said, Lord, thank you. I'm happy now. But this doesn't mean that a man with only daughters isn't happy or that daughters are not a heritage from the Lord. They're, they're still a gift from God. My daughter's name actually means beautiful gift. And so, uh, you know, we, we can look at this, uh, and uh, this is not the context that we're looking at, but uh, this is in context, is written in a time where sons were a blessing because they would help build and they would help protect the family. It was the sons that would go out uh, and protect the home, protect the land. And so a man who had many sons say had many bouncers much security was well protected and so a father with many sons shall not be put to shame is what the text says when he speaks with his enemies in the gate simply put more sons more protection that when men would face their enemies at the gate having many sons was again was like having many bodyguards they would go and they tr would try to negotiate you know, deals, and, and uh, the sons would go with the father, and the enemy would look and say, okay, he's got, you know, he's got some protection. Now, let's take it easy. Let's not mess with him. And so there, was, there would be less of a chance you would look like a fool when confronted or when you were disputing your enemy. Now, does this mean that a man back then would just need to have a bunch of uh, sons and that's it? Does this mean that nothing else was important in raising his children? Was there nothing else that he needed to do besides just having, having uh, sons and giving them weapons and that's it? No, there was more to raising sons. There was more to having kids. There had to be some lessons taught. There had to be an investment made in teaching and raising his sons in the right way, that it was up to the man to raise and to teach uh, the son and surviving in how to protect the family and how to go and gather and how to go and survive. That was the responsibility of the man. The last thing a man needs it's a bunch of sons running around like untamed beasts, right? And this is exactly what we're seeing in this world today. We are seeing a lot of sons running around untamed, uncontrolled, undisciplined. Why? Because the father has become absent. The father is no longer around to teach. The father is no longer around to influence. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother or brings heartache to his mother. 
brings pain to his mother. A, a, a son, a child left without rebuke, left without discipline, left without any control, brings shame to the family, brings shame to the name, brings pain and agony. So children, son or daughter, they both need direction. They need instruction. They need discipline in order to go in the right direction. And both have a responsibility. See, one has the responsibility to teach and the other has the responsibility to apply what they are taught. That we as men, we are the priests of the home. As fathers, we are the priests of the family, that we are the ones to instruct, that we are the ones to guide, that we are the ones to counsel. You know, I appreciate, uh, you know, getting woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and, oh, Dad, pray for me, or, oh, Dad, I feel sick. You know, when, when it comes to that stuff, they wake me up, and I go, and I pray, and I lay hands on them, I encourage them, I, you know, do, do my thing as a father. But I remember growing up as a young disciple, I remember I, I never really did that with my dad. Anytime I was troubled, I'd go and I'd knock on the door, and I would always wake up my mom. Mom, pray for me. <laughs> and it would be my mom that would counsel me, encourage me. But there was those hard-learned lessons that dad gave me, brought discipline brought correction. And it may not have been the right correction. It may not have been the right discipline, but he brought direction to my life. He brought stability. Couldn't mess with that. I was afraid. But see, one has to teach. One has to learn. And I'm no archer or claim to know anything about archery, but it doesn't really matter what what brand or what quality of a, a, an arrow is, if the archer doesn't have the skill to shoot at the target, it doesn't matter if it's a good arrow, doesn't matter if it's a bad arrow, because the archer doesn't have an aim. The archer has no experience, has no skill, can't hit the target. So then it doesn't matter how good a, an arrow is. But this tells me that the archer needs to have a lot of practice to have precision. See, you and I, as fathers, we don't have it down yet, right? We don't have it down packed. I haven't mastered the skill of father, fatherness, fatherhood. I don't know, whatever word it is, being a father. I haven't, I haven't mastered it yet. I'm, I'm still working on it. But uh, I have an aim. I have an aim. I have a goal of where I want to see my kids. And that's where I'm guiding them. And I have to be that spiritual, uh, uh, that spiritual advisor of the home. And this is why I find myself praying. This is why I find myself in the Word of God so that I can know how to raise my kids in the things of God. We need a lot of practice. We need a lot of prayer as fathers. It takes practice to make an arrow hit the target. And so let's look at directing the arrows. Because somewhere in life, we have to find ourselves bringing direction. We heard this text earlier in the month, Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old... He will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way that he should go. I don't know if you've ever trained for anything, but training is painful. Training is exhausting. Training requires a lot of patience. Requires a lot of time, a lot of effort. Effort uh, requires a lot of sacrifice. 
I've trained for baseball, I've trained for track, I've trained for uh, basketball, I've trained for sports, I've, I've trained for jobs, I've trained for a lot of things. But none of those things prepared me when I entered into training of fatherhood. It's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different responsibility. But yet, fatherhood trained me to be a man of God has taught me to be a husband, has taught me to be faithful, has taught me to be consistent, has taught me to be patient. Were there times that I wanted to put my kids' lights out? Yeah. Was there times that I've made mistakes? Yeah. I found myself getting down to their level, seeing them eye to eye and apologizing for things that I said that I shouldn't have said, for doing things I shouldn't have done. And I found myself humbling myself before them, before them asking them to forgive me because I've done wrong. Well, I would never do that. Well, I did. I was quick to forget or I was quick to ask forgiveness. I was quick to, to uh, admit my mistakes. Even though I didn't want to, there was a lot of mistakes that I made. But I had a name. I was learning to train up a child in the way that he should go. People didn't always agree with the way we trained our kids. They didn't always agree in the way that we would discipline our kids. You know, we didn't beat them. We didn't, uh, you know, make blood come out of their nose and bruise their bodies. But we disciplined them. We directed them in the way that they should go. We brought correction to their mistakes. And the funny thing is, is we started at about six months old. Little, little spankings on their tushy, you know. Because by, by then, you're, you know, they're starting to get attitudes. You begin to train them slowly. You begin to train them little by little and teaching them in the way that they should go. Going to need to have a parenting class very soon. Anyways, that wasn't in my notes. Uh, where was I? So... In the training part, this is where the father comes in, comes into the picture. Because the archer, or the father is the archer, he's the one that directs the arrow. And don't get me wrong, the mother plays a big role in this as well. You know, the father is not in this by himself. He's not Rambo. He's not, uh, you know, the, 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 main, the main honcho in the home. I could not do this without my wife. She has, as I bring correction to my kids, she has brought correction to me. You've gone a little too far. You know, she wheels me in. Oh, easy, tiger. Okay, all right. You want to punish them for a whole year because they spilled milk? No, that's not right. You know, not that exaggerated, but that exaggerated. But the, the father plays a big role in discipline and bringing direction. And I'm talking about fathers because it's Father's Day. So, mothers, you had your chance. I, I talked about you on Mother's Day, but now it's the fathers. So is it always going to be our fault if the arrow doesn't hit the target? Is it always going to be our fault because uh, the arrow wants to go where it wants to go? No. We do our part to build our skills and our abilities to be a father can be our fault if we don't train our children in the way that they should go. It'll be our fault if we turn a blind eye instead of disciplining, instead of bringing instruction, instead of being the godly man or the godly provider in the home. Now, whether you are a God-freeing man or not, it would still be your responsibility to teach your children the way they should go. We can't let them just run wild and do whatever they want to do. I know nowadays the world is, is telling them, you know, express yourself, be who you want to be. Uh, if you want to be a, a duck, you can be a duck. If you want to be a gorilla, you can be a gorilla. You can be whatever you want to be. That's what this world is teaching nowadays. 
Whatever you think is right and whatever you think uh, you want to do, then that's what you're going to do. Just be yourself. But as a father, we have to come and we have to bring balance. We have to bring instruction. We have to bring direction. I say, you think you're a superhero? You're not a superhero. That's what I would tell, you know, my kids. You're not, you, you think you're big and but you're not big and bad. You think you're special. Listen, you are special, but you're, you're not that special. You have, to, you have to be able to bring them to a place of, of understanding, of respect. You have to teach them boundaries. You have to teach them uh, lines they shouldn't cross. So this is why we must take care of the heritage that God has given us. Listen, I love my kids. I love my kids. They're a gift from God. They truly are a gift from God. They get on my nerves sometimes, and I'm sure I get on their nerves, but they're a heritage. Your kids are a gift from God. Let's treat them that way. Let's train them that way. Let's raise them in that way. We know people can build up their ability to hit the target all the time. Right? We, we know that people can become professionals. But there are many times that your arrow is going to miss the target. There's going to be unexpected wins. There's going to be some circumstances that are going to be out of your control. And, and being cute and pretty, uh, you know, being a cute and pretty baby doesn't guarantee that that child is going to grow up to be cute and pretty in their attitude. That cute and you know cuddly baby is going to turn monstrous. If we don't treat them right. Our kids are not always going to be kids. You know, it's just my daughter's going to be 20 years old this this year. 20 years old. Namaste, namaste, yeah, namaste, namaste. They grow up too fast. I remember she was still a little, little chunky girl with little, little braids sticking out, you know, walking around the house, singing around in her diaper. Oh, Jesus. But now our kids grow up. They've got attitudes. They got some funk in them. You know, they don't they grow up fast. But one thing I do, I, I'm thankful for is that we enjoyed that childhood. We enjoyed those memories. We enjoyed that time with them. Went on vacations together, went on walks and bike rides and picnics and you know, all those things, we, we enjoy their childhood. And listen, their heritage, enjoy their time, but teaching them in the way that they should go. Our family time consisted of us walking to the library with flyers at hand, and we would invite people to, to church and tell people about Jesus and pray for people. That was our family time. There was a time where they... Wanted a life like their friends. Oh, well, you're, they let them do this and they let them do that. And it was up to us to teach them, listen, look at their life. Look at how they're living. Look at, you know, we go to your sports events. We do this together. And how many of your friends don't, don't have their parents there? And, you know, you're teaching them and you're trying to, you're trying to get them to understand life. You're trying to get them to understand that, you know, it's a blessing to, to have boundaries. It's a blessing to have restrictions. I wish I had those boundaries and restrictions when I was a kid. I wish my dad was a little bit more strict with me. I would have spared myself a lot of pain. But we have a very small window of influence, fathers. A very small window. This means we have an increased responsibility to sharpen up our parenting skills. As a father, I spent a lot of time praying. 
a lot of time crying out to God. God, help me. God, you need to teach me because I have no idea what I'm doing. Many times I would lock myself in my office and I would cry out to God, God, I need your instruction. God, I need your wisdom. I don't know how to be a father. I don't know how to love my children. I don't know how to give them instruction. But it was still my responsibility. And his response, God's response to me was very deep. It was very... Uh, very impactful what God spoke to me. And I'm going to sum up in one, into one word what God spoke to me in these last 20 years of me crying out to him. Remember, I cried out to him a lot. But if I can sum it up into one word, that one word is going to be learn. Learn. God, I don't know, then learn. But God, I, I learn. But I messed up. I fall short, then learn. I don't know how to be a father, a, a godly father, then learn. I never had a father, then learn how to have a father. Learn to be a father. Learn to behave as a father. Learn to think as a father. Learn to love your children. Learn to teach your children. Learn to discipline your children. Learn to direct their lives. Learn to bring instruction. In other words, learn to be a father to your children. Learn. See, how could I expect God to fix my children if I wasn't doing my part to teach them? Father is responsible for shaping the arrow. And this is why it's critical to have strategy. This is why it's critical to have instruction. And as I mentioned yesterday to the men, you cannot leave it up to the school systems to raise your children. You can leave it to the streets or the media to raise your children, but they're only going to make a mess of them. You cannot leave it to your wife or to others to raise your children. You're the father. You're the father. Oh, but she stays home. But you're the father. You're the father. Many times I would come home and it was like tag team. All right, your turn. All right, ding, ding, you know. My wife, you know, I get home, her hair is all in shambles, and the kids are crying, and she's like, I just can't. And I come in and step in. Why? Because I was the father. I was uh, the one that would try to bring instruction, bring direction. My kids say they're a lot more afraid of my wife than they are of me, but that's okay. That's all right. Their time will come when they have kids. And I'm going to just sit there and say, I told you so. Told you so. <laughs> There's a quote that says, A warrior never steps into battle without first understanding who his enemy is. As a parent, it is important to understand our battle. This isn't a, a battle of, of uh, uh, you know, who's bigger and who's better. This is a spiritual battle. We're trying to lead our kids spiritually in the things of God. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. See, that's the part that I had failed to understand. I wanted to bring my instruction. You're going to do as I tell you to do. You're going to do as I tell you to do. But that's where I was failing. Here, according to the word of God, it says, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. That changes the game. So let's know our target. It was Zig Ziglar. 
famous salesman, business advisor, a great man, motivational speaker. But he says, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Father, what's your aim with your children? Even if they're older children, what's your aim with your children? Is it just to be cool dad? I mean, I'm cool dad. Whether I try or not, I'm cool dad. Just don't ask my son. But is that our aim? Is just to be a cool dad? Just to be a friend? Our aim should be to be that spiritual advisor, to be that spiritual uh, uh, foundation, to be that guidance, to be the strength, uh, to be the discipline, uh, to be the encourager, to be the one that's going to be the godly, uh, the godly figure or the godly example. As a believing father, your aim should be Jesus. To point your children to Jesus in every way you can. One of the things that I've tried to teach my children, even as a young, from a very young age, is no matter what happens, I'm going to follow Jesus. I would pray that with them. I would say that to them. That no matter what happens, I'm going to follow Jesus. Why? Because I wanted them to trust in God. I was going to fail them. I was going to fall short. But Jesus will never fail them. Point them to Jesus, especially through my example, through the way that I lived, through the way that I behaved. My goal wasn't just to raise good kids. My goal wasn't just to raise polite kids. My goal wasn't just to raise a couple of cute and friendly kids. My goal as a father was to raise my kids in the way that they should go. To be honest. I've shot myself many times in the foot because I didn't always get it right. Like I said, I've made mistakes. My heart was crushed when my wife said I wasn't the perfect husband. Oh, I'll argue that. But see, I knew my target was to aim them at Jesus. If anything, I know where I can find Jesus. So I can point them to him. I may not have all the answers, but I know Jesus does. If I raise them in any other way without Jesus, their lives would be spiritually empty. I'll let you in on the best parenting skills I have. If you want to write it down, then write it down. But my best parenting skills were done on my knees before the Lord. That's where I had the best parenting skills, was learning to pray, learning to cry out to God, learning to depend on God. When I had no answers, when I've had it up to here, right? You've had it up to here. Your arm gets tired from spanking them. You run out of objects to throw at them. Come on, don't let me, don't let me, don't let me, don't let me make, don't make me think that I'm the only one here. Well, oh, you're the pastor. Like I said, I made mistakes. But listen, that's where I learned to be a father. I was down on my knees crying out to God. On my knees asking God to help me. Spend a, a lot of time praying for my children, crying for my children. Third John, verse 2 to 4 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your souls prosper. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth says in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. We've told our kids, even with tears in our eyes, that all we want for them to do with their life is just love God. Just love God. 
If anything, we've taught our kids is just love God. I don't care where you go, what you do in life, just love God. And as a father, that's what I want to teach my children, is to love God. That is the best thing you can do, is to teach your children to love God. Teach them by your example. Teach them by your leadership to just love God. Because if they love God, it's sure that they're going to hit the target as long as they love God. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to fly off the handle. But if they love God, they're going to rebound and they're going to come back to the cross. And this is why the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he gets old, he will not depart from it. Why? Because there's that love for God. There's that hunger for God. There's that security in God. This morning, dads, ask God to make you a godly man. Doesn't matter how old or how young your children are. Ask God to help you become a godly man. Draw your knowledge, your strength, your direction from God. Not from Dr. Phil or Oprah. Draw it from God. Maybe your kids have grown up. Maybe your kids have made some bad decisions. Listen, it's not too late for them to find their way to the cross. It's not too, too, too late for them to find hope in your change. It's not too late for God to mend that relationship. And This is where you will find yourself contending on your knees for their soul. Maybe you grew up without a father figure. And your excuse is, I don't know how to be a godly father. Then learn. Learn. Learn to be what you didn't have. Learn to be what you wish you had. Psalms 27, verse 10, and I'll leave you with this. When my father and my mother, the Bible says in Psalms 27, verse 10, it says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. When my mother, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Listen, we're going to fail them. We're going to fail our children. But if we can teach our children that they can trust in God, God's never going to fail them. God is always going to be there for them. Why? Because God is faithful. And fathers, God can change your heart. God can change your aim. He can restore what the enemy has destroyed. But will you find yourself on your knees crying out to God, to help you learn, help you be that godly man, help you be that man that your children need. Let's cry out to God. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes for just a few moments. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Just want to give you an opportunity this morning to make a decision. And this decision isn't necessarily just for fathers. This decision right now is for anyone who isn't saved, who, is, who hasn't given their lives to Jesus. You're living your life thinking or doing what you think is right, you're living your life in the way that you have been taught, or this is all I've known. But listen, the Bible says that there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to destruction. And your life right now is without a Savior. You don't have a relationship with the Lord. You're living in sin. 
Sin separates us from the love of God. But this morning, you want to have a relationship with God. You want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need prayer, and you want to surrender your heart to Him. You're done trying to make change on your own. You're done trying to bring a direction to your own life. You're, you've tried to change. You've tried this. You've tried that. And you find yourself at the same dead end. Can I encourage you to just surrender to God and allow Him to be the Lord of your life? And as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? You want Christ to be the Lord of your life. We want to pray with you. Would you lift up your hand? Anyone this morning? Lift it up. You want Christ to be the Lord of your life. Forgiveness of sins. Amen. God sees that hand. Anyone else this morning? Lift it up. Amen. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Maybe this morning you've, you've come with an expectancy of, let's see what God's going to do in my life. I understand it's Father's Day. But ladies, I want to encourage you to take some time to pray for these men, to pray for these fathers. Wife, pray for your husband. Wife, pray for your husband that he would have a, a, a godly mindset. That he would have the mindset of a godly man. That he would find himself crying out to God. That he would find himself on his knees looking to God for wisdom and direction. Come before God and pray for him for his heart to become softened to the things of God. Pray for your husband. Pray for the father of your children. Maybe the father isn't in the picture. Pray that he would become a good influence, a godly influence to your children. Or single mother, pray that a father figure, a godly man, would come into their, into their life and be able to bring direction and correction to them. You've heard it from my wife. She had no father, but there were men who were able to step in and bring direction and bring correction to her life. And because of that, she is serving God. Why? Because there were men that were willing to fill in that gap. And maybe you're here, maybe you're a man, and maybe you don't have kids. Maybe your kids have grown. Doesn't mean you cannot be a spiritual father to other kids doesn't mean you cannot pray for them, does not mean you cannot encourage them, does not mean that you can't invest yourself into their lives. Listen, we are in need of men, we are in need of fathers, we are in need of godly role models in this place. Look at the world that we live in. We need righteous men to stand in the gap. We need righteous men, young and old, men of all ages, to make righteous decisions. We all have a role to play. I want you to find a place to pray this morning. You cry out to God. If you're a wife, pray for your husband, pray for your father. If you're a man, pray for yourself. But let's pray. Let's take some time to just really seek God and allow Him to have right away. So let's take a few moments. Let's cry out, church. These altars are open. You come find a place to pray as we sing the song. You've given my soul a 
be difficult but it's really not that not that difficult all it takes is for us just to be surrendered to God saying God here I am and uh, sometimes the mom the, the mom the mother needs to play and fill in that role of of the father but you know what God's going to give you strength God's going to help you but pray for men that can influence the lives of your children young and old Young and old. I've had moms come up to me, hey, there's this kid, you know, and he's a 30-year-old, 40-year-old kid. But they're looking and they're praying for, for God to find somehow, some way for this guy to be influenced by someone who loves God. Listen, it's not too late. Kids are never too old. Right? We can find a place to make an impact. But let's pray for our fathers. You pray for your husband, uh, that God will give them wisdom. God will give them direction because we need it. 
Amen. Remember the announcements. We're going to be dismissed. Be here four o'clock for the outreach. And uh, uh, God help us. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Stefan, would you lift your voice? Dismiss us this morning. Amen.